Ah, space. A vast vat of vastness. The blanketing stars twinkle above us benignly, wink at us repeatedly like peculiar uncles. But does anyone else see them winking? Look around you at the universe. <laughs> Big, isn't it? But are we alone here? In the summer of 1950, Enrico Fermi, one of the great physicist brains of the 20th century, was having lunch at work with his esteemed colleagues, intently discussing whether or not space aliens were stealing their dustbins. <laughs> Suddenly, Fermi punctured the scholarly mood. He exclaimed, Where is everyone? That is to say, if space is so vast, we should constantly be surrounded by beings from all the many millions of other inhabited planets that must exist somewhere, but they never call, they never visit. <laughs> Hence, the Fermi paradox. Where is everyone? Hmm. Please welcome your guide through this conundrum tonight. Someone else who has talked to her office colleagues about space aliens and then also had to ask, where is everyone? <laughs> Helen Keane! Yes, welcome to It Is Rocket Science, a series where we unravel the mysteries of space travel. I'm aided as ever by a powerful supercomputer. Earlier tonight, I attached a coat hanger to his mainframe so he can pick up signals from the stars and also from my neighbour's skybox. Yes, I built him myself. It's the voice of space! Hello. <laughs> so... Is our universe teeming with multitudinous varieties of life? Or bleak, lonely, incomprehensible emptiness? Or maybe a bit of both. See also, the only way is Essex. <laughs> Alien contact is something I've thought about a lot. Greetings. We are broadcasting to you, all the people of Earth. And greetings in particular to you, Helen Keane, who is in fact not an Earthling, but an advanced being of superior sensitivity just like us. I knew it! This would explain your extraordinary perceptiveness, yes. your unusually high intelligence, yes. and your anal tentacles. Actually, I'm not sure you've got the right Helen Keane. But would this even be our first contact with aliens? Human beings are certainly adept at imagining. A quote from a very reliable source, the internet. The only theory that is supported by all of the data is that the moon is a gigantic extraterrestrial craft brought here eons ago by intelligent beings, and there is no data that seems to contradict this theory. <laughs> So, people have been imagining that there were beings on other planets at least as far back as the ancient Greeks. Nearer to our own time, the almost forgotten 17th century French poet and playwright, Bernard de Fontenelle, wrote one of the first popular science books. It attempted to explain the Copernican sun-centred model of the universe in popular language. Well, in French. <laughs> he did not stop at describing the movements of the planets. He also discussed what strange extraterrestrials might live on them and how they might differ from normal human beings. Well, the French. <laughs> in fact, he gets really caught up in imaginative descriptions of his fictitious aliens. Were he alive today, he'd probably be spending all of his time on Wikipedia, look it up, or writing operas in Klingon. Please don't infer any judgment about people who do that from the tone of my voice. <laughs> but as a 17th century Frenchman, his book took the form of mildly racist chat-up lines to a pretty girl. <laughs> Tell me more of the people of this hot planet Venus, the planet of L'Amour. Why, they're all mad and passionate and hot, like the foreigners from the hot countries. And they are always at it, like the foreigners from the hot countries. <laughs> oh, Bernard. And... They have a language which I have spent many years making up. I mean learning. Ooh. And I will address your beauty in it now, if I may. my baguette over there. I must just go and see. As far as many people in the 19th century were concerned, it was just obvious that there was life on other planets. But how were they to make contact? In the early 1800s, Austrian astronomer Josef von Littroff suggested this method. 
We will speak to the alien intelligences by using the universal language of the mathematics. Everyone understands mathematics, but hmm, maybe this alone will not be enough to grab the alien attention. In this case, we might combine the mathematics with another universal language, the universal language of setting fire to things. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you... Maths. <laughs> we could dig huge trenches in vast geometric shapes in the Sahara Desert. These could be filled with kerosene and set ablaze to signal the presence of our friendly intelligent selves to alien civilizations. But von Littrow wasn't the only 19th century pyromaniac using the prospect of alien communication as a beard. <laughs> In the 1870s, French inventor Charles Creux repeatedly petitioned the French government to build a giant mirror that could be used to communicate with Martians and Venusians by focusing light and burning giant lines and shapes onto the deserts and plains of their planets, creating... Voila, le blazing parallelogram of interstellar friendship. <laughs> with the coming of spaceflight, attempts to make contact were rather more alluring. The great Carl Sagan designed the plaque on the Pioneer space probe to provide a tasteful, non-flamey visual representation of humankind. It featured a picture of a naked man and a naked woman. The woman was drawn with no genitals because they didn't want the aliens to get offended by filth. <laughs> Pioneer will carry a soft-core pictorial message to alien civilizations. <laughs> Nothing too graphic, just a bit of fun like in Nuts or Zoo. <laughs> One day, later probes could even have pictures of the female cast of Hollyoaks pretending to les it up with each other. <laughs> billions and billions of times. Hmm? And still there has been no contact. But suppose that they are out there, these oh-so-advanced beings with technologies and energy needs far beyond our imagining. Physicist Freeman Dyson has suggested that such a civilization might build some kind of structure around its local star to capture every single bit of solar energy. These Dyson spheres would be able to harness the energy and radiation of a star to power intergalactic empires and spaceships and to dry your hands in less than 10 seconds, leaving a carbon footprint 74% smaller than that of paper towels. And these mega structures might be something even our relatively primitive technology is able to spot. So, the hunt for actual aliens goes on. Humanity would like to meet alien civilization. Kindness and willingness not to devour us like so many watery meat bags. More important than looks. Uh, compatible genitals, not essential, but a plus. What might be the reasons why humanity and Helen Keane are still alone? Yes, thank you. Are there no aliens here in the audience tonight? The light glinting off their bulbous foreheads as they wave their sort of tentacles from their sort of ears. No, the tentacles are somewhere else. I think we've established that. <laughs> First of all, we're just assuming that if they wanted to send us a message, they could. We're assuming that if there really are old civilizations, they'll be highly technologically sophisticated, far in advance of us. But is it really true? The older the being, the greater the technical ability. You may have an opinion on this if you've ever tried to teach your parents slash grandparents to send a text message. Long have we waited for this day. The delivery of our very first message to the Eldari, the most ancient civilization in all the universe. Pray tell immediately what great wisdoms have their venerable intelligences replied with. Mm, well, Captain, what I'm seeing on the screen is, uh, hello, yen sign, 56219, colon, is Vos wonking. <laughs> and it's all in block capitals, Captain. That's an excerpt from Star Trek, the previous generation. Science tries to be as objective as possible to let reality speak for itself. But extraterrestrials pose a problem because right now, human beings have only experienced them in their imaginations, not in reality. Not even you, David Icke. <laughs> it's comforting to imagine that any advanced alien race would be intelligent and friendly and kind, like a multi-tentacled Morgan Freeman. But there's really no reason to assume that the dominant alien species across the universe would be the most intelligent one. It could be a violent intergalactic bully. 
And this might make any other more intelligent species think twice before attempting to make contact. Flaunting your intelligence in a dangerous environment can be a risky thing, as anyone else who went to a comprehensive in Hull will know. <laughs> Stephen Hawking has said, We have only to look at ourselves to see how intelligent life might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. Yeah, I think he might have been bullied at school too. Um, it's also possible that they are deliberately not speaking to us. Sometimes, for whatever reason, people will decide that they don't want to talk to you and are going to essentially ignore you, but that doesn't mean that you're not a nice, funny, intelligent person. It probably means that they are jealous of you. That's a direct and very reassuring quote from my mum. Which brings us to alien abductions. The apocryphal, unsuccessful blind date of interplanetary encounters. It seems unlikely that aliens would have time to do all the abductions they're accused of. Also, why would they want to? My people have been observing the human race for thousands of your Earth years. But not in a creepy way. <laughs> We've been doing it in order to prompt a great awakening and mutual cosmic cooperation based on our advanced spirituality. Hmm. I feel like can't quite make your primitive mind understand. Right, okay, try this. It's a bit like if you found out you were being secretly watched from the airing cupboard by Bono and or Sting. <laughs> Occasionally, Bono and or Sting would find it necessary to come out from hiding in your airing cupboard to abduct members of your family to conduct <laughs> experiments. But you trust Bono and or Sting had your best interests at heart, wouldn't you? It would be slightly unfortunate if an alien leader contacted us and then had to spend their time travelling around the world apologising for all the past unpleasantnesses and dubious acts by their rogue colleagues. See also His Holiness the Pope. <laughs> Finally, some scientists, including Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick, and to be fair, some unconventional thinkers too, have questioned whether or not life on Earth could ever have begun and aided without the help of these superior alien beings. Perhaps, they say, life here was seeded by aliens, a theory known as directed panspermia. Spermia meaning seed, pan meaning all, and directed because otherwise it really does go everywhere. <laughs> If this is the case, then the aliens are already here. They're us. Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the cosmos, or we are not. Both prospects are staggering. <laughs> Whether we're setting fire to other people's property, sending out softcore porn where none has gone before, or looking for alien hand dryers, the motivation is always the same. A desire to prove we're not on our own to cast aside our nights in with a ready meal, and to venture out into the starry universe, joining hand with three-fingered webbed hand, or incomprehensible misty blur. In a short story in 1948, science fiction author, visionary genius, and slightly creepy uncle figure, Arthur C. Clarke, <laughs> said this. I can never look now at the Milky Way without wondering from which of those banked clouds of stars the emissaries are coming. If you will pardon so commonplace a simile, we have set off the fire alarm and have nothing to do but to wait. I do not think we will have to wait for long. It is Rocket Science, starred Helen Keen, Peter Serafinowicz and Susie Kane. The show was written by Helen Keen and Miriam Underhill. And the producer was Gareth Edwards. <laughs>